Japan's undergoing a, well, to use the German, a sort of Zeitung vendor of its own. But I would put it a bit more strongly, I think it's a revolution um, in terms of how it's uh, thinking about its uh, security and how it's trying to deal with its security challenges and so on. Robert Ward is a Japan chair at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, with decades of experience with Japanese foreign, defense, and security policies. We talked about why Japan is abandoning its pacifism, how does it see the threat from China, and whether it would join a potential war over Taiwan. Enjoy. So, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. If we can start um, by... Uh, sort of talking about how Japan is changing in regarding to its uh, sort of security and, and defense policies, because I think that most people, if they have any knowledge of Japan in this area, it's probably that Japan is a pacifist or anti-militaristic uh, country that isn't very concerned with these matters. And it seems from the outside like that has been changing quite drastically. And I was wondering if you could um, talk a little about that and explain um, what does that change include, how it does it look, and what is driving it. So I might take issue with calling Japan pacifist. Uh, I think anti-militarist is probably a better way of putting it, and that's an important uh, filter to, to sort of understand what's going on at the mm -hmm. moment, despite uh, the famous uh, anti-war uh, Article 9 of the Constitution, but we can perhaps talk about that a bit later if we've got time. Um, Japan's undergoing a, well, to use the German, a, a Zeitung vendor of its own, but I would put it a bit more strongly, I think it's a revolution um, in terms of how it's uh, thinking about its uh, security and how it's trying to deal with its security challenges and so on. Um, if you've got a long memory, you'll uh, remember the early 90s, the first Gulf War, where Japan was uh, expected to contribute in the sort of post-Soviet uh, era to uh, the first conflict of the post-Soviet era. Uh, it struggled to do that. It, it sent lots of money uh, to the Allied effort, but didn't send any any people uh, to go and to go and fight. So that that was a trauma for the Japanese uh, government, for diplomats, for pretty much everyone uh, in Japan who had to make a decision. Uh, if you go th then through into the late 1990s, uh, you get some security reforms under Hashimoto Ryutaro, the prime minister, in the late 90s. Uh, then you get more uh, security changes under uh, Koizumi Junichiro in the early 2000s. And then you get a real fast-forwarding uh, under Abe Shinzo, uh, some legal changes and so on, changes to the U.S. Uh, uh, cooperation guidelines uh, as well. But what you've got now, pretty much since um, the uh, new national security strategy came out at the end of uh, 2022, is, a, is, a, is basically a, a sort of a closing of one chapter of uh, the way Japan looked at the world and an opening of another. Um, and this uh, new chapter sees Japan as more autonomous, uh, more capable, uh, having a different view about where its uh, role within the, the key uh, security alliance with, with the U.S. is, um, and also having a sort of actively conceptualizing stress, in, uh, a, a risk rather, in, in, in the region. Um, and this sort of puts an end to what uh, those of us look at Japan call the Yoshida Doctrine, which basically governed Japan's um, thinking around security from 1945 until, uh, perhaps until we could say until 20, uh, 2022. Um, one of the key uh, elements of this change is uh, in the national security strategy at the end of last year, which, which saw um, Japan sort of articulating that it would take primary responsibility for its own defense um, and to defeat uh, any invasion. So not sitting within the kind of warm embrace, sort of safe embrace of the U.S. Uh, security alliance, but actually uh, taking an active role uh, within that alliance. And that's, uh, I would say, for Japan, absolutely revolutionary given its post-war history. And to um, dig deeper a little bit into that, I, you've called the, the shift in thinking about security in Japan a revolution. Um, could you talk a little bit about what has caused this revolution? It has been, if it has been sort of a longer internal process or if it were external factors and threats? In the in the nineties and the and the early two thousands, Japan was still the, the world's second largest economy by quite a long margin, quite a wide margin. Um, the idea that it was that China would enter the WTO and become a sort of benign actor, sort of economic integration would make China a sort of friendly actor. All of that, um, I think, Japan initially broadly uh, sub subscribed to. 
Um, but then in the sort of mid 2000s, um, sort of shifts within uh, China's domestic thinking about the where, where it stood in, in the world. And then for Japan, in 2010, uh, Japan was overtaken by China as the world's second largest uh, economy. That was uh, a sort of an epoch-making uh, moment uh, for Japan because f for the first time in many, many, many years, of decades, centuries, uh, Japan was going to be faced with a, uh, a quite a strong China. And then in, also in 2010, Japan had a bit of economic coercion uh, pointed at it by uh, China as a result of a, um, a territorial, uh, territorial spat. So wind forward um, over the 2010s and you have a more assertive uh, Chinese government under President Xi Jinping. Uh, you have North Korea is starting to, uh, well, is continuing to uh, pursue its uh, WMD programs, particularly on the nuclear side, and of course, shooting uh, test missiles uh, sort of over Japan or at Japan, uh, for example. Um, and then, of course, more, more recently, you've had uh, Russia's invasion of, of, of Ukraine. Um, and the Prime Minister uh, Kishida Fumio last year, he said, uh, Ukraine today could be uh, East Asia tomorrow. So he was explicitly linking uh, the European and Asian uh, security uh, theatres. So you've got all of these things. Uh, and if you sit in Tokyo and you look to the West, uh, you have almost all either actual hostile or potentially hostile states. You've got, now you've got Russia in the north, you've got North Korea in the middle, and you've got China in, in, in the south. So in, in the um, uh, end 2022 national security strategy, the government describes the strategic environment around Japan as the most, I think, severe and complex as it has ever been since the end of the Second World War. So bleak assessment of the geopolitical realities uh, uh, around uh, Japan. That's also complicated further by the interaction between uh, Russia, North Korea recently, particularly since the invasion of Ukraine, obviously, um, Russia uh, and China, and of course China's relationships with, uh, with uh, North Korea as well. So for Japan, and I think this is again uh, sort of unique in the G7, uh, they face uh, sort of what I call it an arc of uh, threat uh, to their west that, that is that is pretty uh, pretty terrifying if you're sitting uh, sitting in Tokyo and the other the other year just as an example of how this is being operationalized uh, there was a joint naval patrol right right around the island of Honshu uh, by a Chinese Chinese Russian joint naval patrol so if you're sitting in Japan you can see this actually sort of happening uh, in the region and of course there is no other G7 country that's had uh, missiles sort of flown over it by a country like uh, North Korea so I think for, for the West, actually, Japan has a is, is a very um, insightful, I think, to try and look at way Japan thinks about the world because they really do have a sort of panoramic sense of sense of risk, partly, of course, because of their proximity to these countries that I've mentioned. So maybe to uh, take it one uh, threat at a time, um, I would assume that the most pressing and probably the most threatening is, is China. So maybe could you talk about how does Japan see the Chinese threat? And um, also, what is it actually uh, the most worried about? Is it a potential um, uh, more of an economic warfare and political pressure? Or is Japan actually worried about a potential military conflict that could involve um, Japanese self-defense forces? So Japan's uh, government is worried about all, all of these things. Mm. Uh, on, on the first of the things you mentioned, economic threat, well, Japan and um, China are so intimately linked in terms of, of the economy that you know it's very difficult for Japan really to talk um, openly in a broad way about decoupling. I mean, it's very, very difficult to see how these two countries uh, could decouple. But in 2010, there was this economic coercion. Uh, China briefly halted the exports to Japan of some, some critical materials. Japan needed for its electronic industry over this territorial dispat, uh, spat down in, in, in the south over the Senkaku Islands, which, which China calls the Dayu uh, Islands. So Japan's experienced economic coercion is intimately linked with China in, in, its, in, in its economy and, of course, is worried about uh, being caught up in economic coercion uh, in, in the future, uh, particularly, I think, since, um, since Japan has been working with the U.S. in terms of economic security on the tech side uh, as well. So that's the economy. Uh, on the, on the, in terms of security, um, as we were just talking about earlier, these, the Western um, 
um, westernmost tip of Japan, of these small islands uh, in the south of Japan. Uh, the, the westernmost tip of Yonaguni Island is only 100 kilometers uh, away from Taiwan on a clear day. People say you can actually see the, the cliffs of Taiwan rising out of the sea. So if there was any uh, issue uh, in Taiwan, what we call a Taiwan contingency, um, it would not be difficult to see uh, how Japan would get caught up, sort of collaterally, uh, by accident maybe, or, or on purpose. One of the reasons why this area in the south is so serious, is such a sort of serious thing strategically for Japan is because Japan um, runs, uh, administers these islands, the Senkaku Islands, Daiyu in, in, in Chinese for, 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 for a fair, um, balance, um, but uh, China claims them. Uh, and uh, China has been pushing these claims in terms of what we call law lawfare um, increasingly shrilly uh, pretty much since Xi Jinping took office in the early uh, years of, of the last decade. And that includes uh, sending ships uh, in, into, the, into the waters, the Senkaku's waters. The Japanese try to sort of chase them away and sort of monitor this. But uh, you can see that over the past few years there's been a steady stream of this, what, what we I would... I would uh, sort of categorize as normalizing Chinese presence around this area that uh, China claims. Um, so this is an area of extreme strategic uh, importance for Japan. It, uh, the Southwestern Islands, as they're called, were, were, were called out uh, in the national security strategy last year as an area of strategic importance. Uh, Japan's reinforcing its military presence there. It's reinforcing uh, uh, protection, sort of bunkers, air raid shelters, uh, and so on, in, in anticipation of hopefully what will not happen, but anticipation of a uh, of a Taiwan uh, contingency. Um, if you look at China, how China is now sp spending some pretty big money on its on its military. Um, uh, Japan has pretty much been s flat over the past uh, past few years, whereas China's sort of gone up at sort of 45 degrees in terms of military spending. That's what we know about. There's probably other spending uh, as well. So China is now outspending uh, Japan by a, by a, by a significant uh, amount. And that's another reason why in this national security strategy, and I do recommend all the listeners to try and read it because uh, there's so much in it that will sort of, that will back up what I'm what I'm saying. Um, but uh, in this strategy, Japan will just, will spend um, two percent of its GDP on on military uh, spending uh, by t uh, fiscal year 2027, up from around one percent uh, at the moment. It's been around one percent since this this de facto uh, limit was introduced in 1976. Japan's economy is large, so that's a lot of money, and that will take Japan up to, um, we think, is about the third or fourth largest um, uh, defense budget in the world. It's quite interesting that um, still 2%, given the level of potential threat, is not that much. And in Europe and in uh, uh, NATO, we're seeing that now 2% are seen more as the uh, the bottom minimum uh, rather than uh, something we should be aspiring to i think japan also sees that as a floor rather than a, than a ceiling and somewhere that one that, that they can go from uh, after that um one has to be aware that you know on the one even though the the security need is is very clear uh, politicians have to get re-elected uh, and they have to spend taxpayers money and this will be funded by taxpayers uh, money ultimately so there's a sort of political uh, massaging that's going on uh, in, in Japan at the moment to try to uh, get public opinion on board with with the reason why this needs to be this money needs to be spent so th I mean from one percent to two percent that's a that's a chunky, a chunky amount. Um, I suspect that will uh, the, the the pressure on the budget will will only go up um, as as twenty seven year uh, twenty twenty seven comes and goes. I want to talk about the public perception more, but before that, I think I'd like to try to understand the threat perception um, a little bit deeper. And obviously, we're kind of tiptoeing around it, but Taiwan is at the center of the tension and. In the region, and um, I would be curious, what, how does Japan see its role in any potential conflict uh, over Taiwan or uh, including Taiwan, um, and what is the Japanese strategy uh, uh, in regards to this uh, Taiwan uh, issue? So Japan over the last couple of years has been pretty um, clear uh, in a way that it wasn't necessarily before uh, 
that Taiwan's security is also Japan's security. And um, one of the, uh, I think one of the interesting ways they're trying to deal with that is to try to internationalize uh, the issue. So Japan's obviously a huge country still, huge economy is going to have a bu big budget, but it's not anywhere near as large as China. So Japan can't do this on its own. And, 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 and similarly for the US, they, the US, given the, the scale of the channel, challenge from China, also needs to have lots of um, other allies uh, on, on board. But what Japan's been trying to do pretty much, I think, since, uh, since Abe Shinzo's uh, second time in office, 2012 to 2020, is to internationalize uh, the Taiwan issue. China would like to treat it as a domestic issue because it thinks Taiwan is, is part of People's Republic of China. Uh, but Japan is saying, no, this is an international law, national issue and has been um, working with the, the British, for example, the UK, the French, others to, to, get, to, to expand the military pres their military presence in the, um, in the Indo-Pacific, working with the Australians, working with the Indians in the Quad and the Americans as well, try to sort of spread the, um, the, uh, the understanding that this is actually, if something did happen in Taiwan, so an invasion of Taiwan by China, this would be a, a global problem of, of sort of a huge, mm. uh, huge impact. So um, Japan's been increasingly active, in, uh, increasingly clear about uh, its concerns, while, of course, um, trying to preserve uh, good relations with China, which is very close mm -hmm. geographically, of course, but just trying to sort of put some red lines uh, out there saying, you know, if you, uh, if you cross this line, then, of course, you know, it will, it will have consequences. And by adding the UK and France and Germany and other European countries into the mix, you've got, you, the Japan's hoping to sort of complicate the strategic calculation for, uh, for Xi Jinping. In terms of Japan's own role, um, that's a little bit less clear than um, some may wish. Uh, Japan's a democracy, so uh, if Japan was to uh, was to support the U.S. Sort of actively, that would have to go to Parliament and have to be approved, and, and so on. So, what sort of threats might China make against Japan in in, in, in if there was a full fully blown uh, contingency? That of course we we don't know. Um, but I think in the political class there is. Uh, a pretty clear understanding that if uh, Taiwan was taken by China, that would completely change the uh, strategic environment for Japan. Japan would be one of the, the big losers here. Um, so for Japan, I think the stakes are, are incredibly, uh, incredibly high. Also for the US, of course, given the, um, the challenge that uh, uh, a Taiwan um, owned uh, uh, by China would, would, would pose to its, posi its position in the Pacific. And do you think there's I guess, political and public willingness to, in case China attempts to invade Taiwan and the U.S. Uh, would uh, try to militarily stop uh, China from doing that and go into an um, open, large-scale conflict with China. Do you think there is a willingness from the Japanese side to, in such case, join the United States and go uh, into war with China? I think uh, in, the, in terms of the government, I think um, you're seeing interesting government-to-government uh, -government, uh, exchanges with, with Taiwan at a senior level. Um, the sort of eminence gris in the Liberal Democratic Party, the ruling party in Japan, Aso Taro, he was there uh, the other day. So they're, they're, the connections there are, are pretty good. I think the, the issue, as with in all democracies, is public opinion. Mm. And um, Japan's government's done a good job, I think, of sort of nudging public opinion, um, sort of awakening the sense that there is uh, quite a significant risk out there to, to Japan's own security. This has been something that's been going on um, for a, quite, quite a long time, certainly since, the, since 2010, since this, which was a sort of seminal year uh, where Japan first experienced that economic coercion that I was uh, talking about. So I think in terms of um, the public opinion understanding the threat, I think I think that is that is quite well advanced. The only issue, as 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 ever um, in a democracy, is who pays for it. Mm. Um, and uh, raising taxes in Japan is always difficult. Um, the raising the consumption tax in the eighties and then the nineties um, that claimed uh, the scalps of two governments. Uh, you know, raising taxes in anywhere is a problem, but in Japan it seems to be. Uh, can be terminal for governments, um, so the government at the moment is just treading very carefully in, in terms of how to, how this will all uh, all be funded. But I think the basic understanding 
of uh, Japanese voters is that you know there is a serious problem here. Um, then we've got North Korea and Russia, as I mentioned uh, earlier as well, and that Japan is uh, is vulnerable, uh, sort of on the front line, if you like, of uh, great power competition. So the public opinion on this and the understanding of the threats in the region is changing as well. That's changed. I mean, yes, h- hugely so. Um, if you think about the when Abe Shinzo uh, in in his second administration, 2012-2020 administration, uh, he changed uh, he changed some uh, the law to allow the self defence forces, which is Japan's military, to have more um, scope of action. They've been quite sort of heavily circumscribed before, and there were there were a lot of demonstrations. There was a lot of uh, of noise made by those who didn't like it, uh, were, f- were frightened of where this was going to lead and so on. So Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe, he spent a lot of political capital on getting this through Parliament. The 2022 uh, National Security Strategy, which was, I say, a revolution um, in terms of Japan's security posture, not a not a murmur. Um, it just went straight through, mm. uh, and uh, there was there was no uh, sort of there were no big demonstrations, nothing. So mm. I think, you know, 2020, 2015 rather to twenty twenty two. That's only a few years, but in terms of what's changed in the world, that's actually uh, pretty much everything has changed. Uh, of course, you've had the Trump presidency, you've got Xi Jinping um, being more assertive. Uh, you had uh, the issue over Taiwan last year when, mm. when Pelosi went, of course. Um, and North Korea, and, and now Russia has, has you know, turned hostile since the, since Japan's reaction to its invasion of Ukraine. So um, the understanding is there it, it, amongst public opinion, I think, is, is, is quite different now about the threats from what it was, uh, say, in 2015. One more thing on the Taiwan issue is that um, Japan is hosting, I think, several U.S. bases on its territory, and one of them in Okinawa, I think, is the closest U.S. base to Taiwan that it would probably be using if it, uh, in case it wanted to um, defend Taiwan from Chinese invasion. So there is a chance that Taiwan wouldn't really have a choice of becoming an actor in the conflict, but would happen so uh, sort of whether it want, would want it to or not. So one of the one of the criteria that Japan's government, Japanese government has is if, if Japan's national survival uh, is at stake, and uh, that's sort of quite loosely uh, defined. So what do you mean by survival? Is it economic or, or, or how do you describe that? So um, as and when uh, contingency happened, I think there'd be a lot of focus on uh, on that particular term as to how Japan could mm. uh, could could react. The other thing to, to note, though, of course, is, uh, and this is, again, something that Japanese are, are, are very, very aware of, is if there was a Taiwan uh, contingency, what would North Korea do? Would that would North Korea take the opportunity then to start making mischief uh, on the Korean Peninsula? And then what, of course, would Russia do? Uh, because Russia, the the territorial dispute that Japan has with Russia is now frozen, um, unlikely to be uh, unfrozen in in the foreseeable future. Um, Japan's abandoned its uh, the, the the policy it had under Abe Shinzo to to try and get rapprochement with Russia to to try to ensure that Russia did not uh, align with China. So it made good ge- geostrategic sense, although it was obviously in the end uh, a failure. So, as I said earlier, this sort of arc of threat, and if there was a um, that, that Japan has to its west, and if there was a Taiwan contingency, how would those three countries uh, interact? Uh, to uh, to sort of cause mischief uh, for Japan. So m- let's talk about North Korea, maybe from the Japanese perspective, uh, and how uh, what kind of a threat po- North Korea poses to Japan, and also how is the sort of changing uh, uh, threat perception in the region changing Japan's relation with South Korea because. Uh, uh, not being an expert on this issue, my understanding is that the uh, South Korean Japanese relationships were uh, quite uh, uh, complicated for a long time, but now they're being they're coming closer together. Maybe because the United States is actively pushing them closer together as well. So if you could explain that a little bit. So North in the sort of in the hierarchy of threats, mm. uh, North Korea has, has been there for a long time, um, and it, for Japan, it's not just a um, uh, a military threat. It's also the, you know, there's criminality uh, and other things that go on. Plus, there's the outstanding issue for Japan of the Japanese citizens abducted uh, by the North Korean regime um, in the in the I think 1970s, 1980s. 
Uh, North Korea has, uh, has claimed that it, the issue is shut, but for Japan, it's 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 not been solved. And that, of course, for Japan, you have your 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 nationals taken away from your own country, kidnapped. That's an issue of sovereignty for Japan. So that issue is um, is also there. Uh, but in the hierarchy of risks, um, the threats. I think in Tokyo, uh, China is the beast, um, and uh, then uh, North Korea is there. And I mean, North Korea is clearly um, well down the road to getting nuclear, uh, its nuclear program is, is well developed. So clearly that's that in itself presents a sort of physical threat to uh, uh, to Japan. But um, I think because that's been around for so long, hmm. um, it's less, it's sort of, it's not, uh, the, the threat is seen as less uh, so less uh, urgent than, than China. It's still urgent, given <laughs> what sort of regime North Korea <laughs> is, but it's uh, China's the one they're, they're, that they're focused on. Hmm. Um, the relationship with South Korea, um, this is this is as you say, fr been fraught. Um, I remember in 1998, I think it was, when Kim Dae Jung, who was uh, Prime Minister, uh, President of uh, South Korea, he went to Japan. Uh, I think he spoke Japanese because of his because uh, of the, the you know, he's the colonial Japan's colonial past with uh, with South Korea, um, and there was a fantastic sort of flowering of friendship uh, between. Uh, uh, Kim Dae-jung and uh, Obuchi Keizo, Japanese Prime Minister. I think Kim Dae-jung met the emperor, Japanese emperor and, and everything. And that was the sort of moment when I think a lot of us, uh, the Korea watchers and Japan watchers, was thought this this meet, this relationship is finally on the, on, the, on, on the up. And then, of course, it all collapsed for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, and then it sort of looked like it was going to improve again in, in 2015 with the Abe Shinzo Pak uh, Gune agreement on the comfort women called comfort women but then that collapsed as well uh, for various reasons and now we're on the up again so um, this relationship uh, is improving is now the best that it's been since 1998 I, I would say I think it owes more to the efforts of uh, of uh, President Yoon South, South Korea and uh, Prime Minister Kishida their efforts uh, than, than the US obviously President Biden uh, is is very keen on this, so he's been giving it a sort of nice sort of um, breeze to keep keep it going. Um, but these uh, Kishida and Yoon have really put a lot of personal political capital uh, on this, and uh, they've done the uh, they've done the running. And why this has happened now, I think, uh, partly because of North Korea's uh, continued WMD uh, development and all the other things that we we know about with North Korea, but also the issue of Russia invading Ukraine. Um, and go back to the point I mentioned early, that earlier that Kishida said, well, uh, Ukraine today could be East, East Asia tomorrow. Well, that's partly um, uh, Taiwan, of course, but also North Korea, other sort of security uh, theatres. So he's, Kishida has sort of pulled these, uh, pulled the, pulled Europe and, and, and Asia together hmm. um, because it's the sort of the scale and the interconnectedness of, of, of the threat. So um, Yoon, whose government is the most pro friendship with Japan that South Korea's had for two decades. Um, he's a one-term president. Uh, he doesn't really have to worry, he doesn't have to worry about being uh, re-elected. He wants to do this, so he's pushing it, uh, pushing it hard. Uh, and Kishida in Japan, he realizes all these threats that, that are sort of around Japan, plus the, the issue that, um, to the, the threat to the international order that Russia represents, um, and that quite, you can link that to the threat to the international order that China represents as well. So there's some really powerful um, sort of winds uh, pushing these uh, these two together. It's a very, you know, we're really, all of those of those us watching East Asia are really happy with this. It's fantastic, but it is frail. It's a frail, mm. it's a, I call it sort of fragile convergence. Um, and, you know, if there's a change of government in the US next year, for example, you know, how would, um, would it be sustainable? Uh, the Camp David Agreement in uh, summit in um, in August uh, this year. It, it, it really put a lot of um, effort into institutionalizing the, co the connections between these three. So to, to sort of to, to to achieve this sustainability. But uh, you know, if the political will ebbs in mm. either Washington or Seoul or Tokyo, then um, I think it could be a very sort of fragile flower. I guess on this uh, topic, I must ask, what is your opinion on how that development in the region that's sort of positive would uh, change if uh, next year Trump would win and, and go back to office? And I know it's really hard 
to try to predict that. But then again, we've seen Trump in office before, and you've probably analyzed and studied his foreign policy towards uh, East Asia quite deeply. So what's your uh, feeling? Well, uh, of all the G7 leaders, uh, Abe Shinzo, uh, in this long uh, 2012-2020 administration, he was uh, the Trump whisperer uh, without uh, compare. Uh, So he um, and Trump, ultimately, I think they worked quite well together. Uh, and Japan did some of the things that Abe wanted it uh, to do uh, because they managed to uh, uh, get on well over golf, or I don't know what it what it would have been. But uh, but he Abe and Trump had a had a good uh, it, for Japan. It it worked I think mm. quite well. Um, the issue uh, in terms of personal chemistry, I don't know who will be prime minister in Japan next year. Perhaps uh, still Kishida Fumio. So will he would he have the uh, the chemistry that Abe had? How would he uh, navigate? Uh, Potential unpredictability uh, in in the White House should uh, should should Trump win. But I think um, that aside, uh, Japan has been constantly worried, uh, well, for decades now, about two things. One is uh, with regard to the U.S. One is entrapment uh, in of Japan in a uh, in a U.S. Uh, involved uh, conflict and the other is abandonment so being abandoned uh, by the US I think now um, we've talked about in this conversation a little bit about the, the whether Japan would be involved in a Taiwan contingency I think that is now the scale of the threat is, is well understood in Japan uh, to Taiwan and the, what Japan may have to do I think is also well understood so I think entrapment is now less of an issue but mm. abandonment is still a big issue and this is the same for all, I think, all the uh, all the U.S.'s allies. We're permanently worried that the U.S. Uh, won't, won't necessarily be there as much as we want it to be. So um, Abe, in his second administration, again, he, he devoted a lot of effort to building networks, to, uh, we talked about the Quad, uh, so uh, Japan, uh, Australia, U.S. and India, these kind of millilateral, these sort of small groupings to, um, to buttress uh, the um, the influence of countries that Japan uh, has sympathy with and more allies uh, or partners rather uh, in in the region should the US uh, in interest in the region diminish so the, one example of this is the CPTPP the big trade block um, the US was uh, part of the original uh, CPTPP uh, then group and then of course Donald Trump pulled the U- US out so Japan is sort of about a bit forlornly keeping a hope open that uh, sort of candle o- a sort of lit for the US to rejoin the CPTPP at some moment but the CPTPP as one example is uh, is Japan uh, using its networks and using um, its economic influence and so on to just to try to support the rules based order in in the region um, the UK's uh, obviously uh, just joined uh, as well, so that's again a sort of plus for Japan, even though the US isn't in there. Um, just in keeping the sort of seat warm should the US uh, want to come back. So this abandonment thing, I think, is very important for Japan, but Japan's trying to act to ensure that if it does happen, um, it can still keep the um, ensure stability in the region. I also want to go back to um, something we've sort of mentioned, but I want to delve deeper, and that's uh, Ukraine and um, Russia. And I guess the, there's a double question in there. And one is that I would be curious, how has the Russian invasion of Ukraine resonated in uh, Japan? Because I've mentioned before the podcast that I was in Taiwan last week, and the uh, Ukraine scenario definitely resonated there uh, quite heavily, and there are many lessons that the Taiwanese are learning from Ukraine. And I would be curious if in Japan um, the uh, perception is similar. And the follow-up question would be sort of um, how is the Russian threat perceived? Because that's something that I personally haven't really thought about before, Ru- Russia being a threat to Japan. Um but I would be curious to learn more. So the Japanese public has been very interested in um, in Russia's uh, in the war, uh, you know, Russia's invasion and then and fighting the war in, uh, against Ukraine. I was in Tokyo, uh, I think la- last year, and I was in one of the big bookshops, and there was a whole sort of 
wall of books on Russia, on Ukraine, on the war, uh, and so on. That sort of, to me, I was sort of surprised to see it, and I thought that's sort of evidence, if you like, of the uh, how, how the um, in a sense this two things. One thing, the suffering of Ukraine. And the other thing, the invasion of, of one country by another, how that's resonated uh, in, in Tokyo. I think like all of us, we, we thought that um, big war, if you like, sort of inter interstate land-based war uh, was not something that we would see uh, in Europe again. And this is the biggest conflict uh, in Europe since 1945. Um, so I think that, that really has resonated uh, very loudly uh, in, in Japan. Surprisingly so, perhaps, given that uh, how far Japan is away mm. from Europe. However, uh, Japan is a neighbor of Russia. So Russia and Japan are neighbors. So I, I think, and I, I, I'm sure somebody will correct me on this, but I think Japan is closer to continental Russia than, say, France <laughs> is. Uh, or, or it's cheating because it's Siberia, not, not, not European Russia. But you can see that you know, these two countries are neighbors. Um, and this has been a constant uh, sort of Japan's the security of Japan's northern flank has been a constant worry. It was a constant worry over the in the, in the Cold War, uh, for example. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, we've got the uh, territorial dispute, uh, which is sort of un unresolved. Russia and Japan don't yet have a peace treaty after the Second World War, um, and so on. So, um, for Japan now, though, well, a um, Abe Shinzo's uh, policy, as I mentioned earlier, had been to to try to improve relations with Russia, partly because of the territorial uh, dispute which he wanted to, to resolve, but also to prevent Russia allying uh, with China. Because if those two, given mm. uh, you know, their role in the region and their size, that obviously would be, would be bad news uh, for Russia. Um, that's failed. Uh, so now Russia is, is a, seen as, a, a, as quite a threat uh, to Japan uh, in the north. Um, I think the issue, given how stretched Russia is now because of its operations in, uh, against Ukraine, um, J Russia would find it difficult to kind of field a uh, massive amount of kit uh, in, in its Far East. But I think the thing to remember is it doesn't have to do that much to, uh, to draw Japanese uh, military strength away from, say, a Taiwan, uh, dealing with a Taiwan contingency. Mm. If Russia is probing in the north, and you, know, you don't have to do much to, to, to probe, um, then that co sort of complicates Japan's uh, str strategic calculations if there's a, uh, a contingency uh, in Taiwan. So um, this sort of is adding to the, um, to the, str to the strategic concern uh, in, in, in Tokyo, and not least because there, you know, there really isn't much hope now of this, uh, uh, of this territorial dispute being, uh, being resolved. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, Russia also changed the constitution to make it uh, unconstitutional to give territory away, which in hmm. effect sort of closed the door on that uh, on that particular issue for for Japan. Has Japan sent any uh, military equipment to Ukraine, or has it considered it? They're they're a little bit const well, they're constrained over what they can do because of their um, because of their constitution hmm. uh, le legal constraints. Uh, but they have sent um, they've sent aid, and I think they may have sent uh, some bullet proof vests and and what have you so they've done what they um done what they can um one one sort of milestone was uh, prime minister kishida's visit to uh, to kiev in um uh, i think it was earlier earlier this year and that was the first visit by a japanese prime minister to a to an actual war, z war zone um so again prime minister was trying to sort of st to, to make physical this sort of linking between asia uh, and 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 europe mm. You know, if Russia prevails against Ukraine, that is a uh, a blow to the credibility mm. of the, uh, the Japan, U.S., EU, uh, Europe, and so on support of the international rules-based order. And if that de that deterrence is undermined, then that obviously has resonance for uh, China and and Taiwan uh, as well. This is why for Japan. Um, being forward-leaning on Ukraine has been has been so important. So one more thing I'd like to talk about is uh, the preparedness of Japan in case there is a w wider conflict in the region with China. And uh, w I guess one thing to understand is um, what are the limitations that Japan has? Because if uh, the Japan doesn't have a typical military, but it's called self-defense forces and as far as I know, there are some limitations of how those forces can be used rather for defense rather than offense. But I, in any conflict, I think the line between 
defending yourself, defense and offense can blur quite easily. And uh, defense without offense also is sometimes impossible. So I wonder how would that work in, in, in a real life in case there is a conflict that Japan is involved in? Well, there's um, in the national security strategy and uh, the 2022 one, which is actually Japan's second. Uh, the first one was in 2013, so obviously a lot's happened since since, since then. There are two uh, sort of interesting examples of. I mean, you mentioned quite, quite rightly that you know, the difference between offensive and defensive is is a sort of blurred. It's not not sort of black and white. Um, one was the decision to introduce a counter strike missile uh, capability. And the other one was um, to introduce active cyber defense. So these are sort of all within the, the realms of constitu- what's allowed in the Constitution, but mm. obviously uh, for Japan, quite, um, uh, quite, significant, uh, quite significant changes. Another important point related to that is um, the need to, imp- need to strengthen Japan's defense industrial base. Uh, so Japan's got these fantastic manufacturing companies, huge conglomerates and so on. But because of the sort of historic legacy, sort of the anti-militarism that prevailed after the Second World War, um, these companies, some of them have got great capabilities and so on. They've always been sort of minor players within the within the conglomerates, sort of not really coming out into the sunshine very much, doing their thing, um, not really big within the conglomerate, even though you know they've got some important uh, cap- capabilities, um, and so that's left Japan with uh, a defence industrial base that's. Uh, quite fragmented, where the companies are quite small, so finding it difficult to get uh, economies of scale, where the smaller companies are not necessarily um, terribly financially robust, um, where over the years Japan's been left with deficits of ammunition, for example, um, where it needs to uh, build strength, um, defensive um, uh, res- resilience rather in things like port infrastructure, road infrastructure, and so on. So, this defence improvement of the defence in res- strengthening of the de- defence industrial base is absolutely critical uh, for Japan, and that's one of the reasons why Japan's uh, working with the UK and Italy, for example, on the GCAP, uh, the, the the fighter uh, program uh, that was announced, uh, I think, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, um, to try and sort of get the um, get the expertise and to sort of share the expertise that that that, that Japan's got. Um, Japan also wants to build an export base uh, in defence kit. Um, there's been again legal uh, constraints around mm. that, but they're trying. The party LDP is trying to trying to loosen those. Um, and again, that's all ways that Japan's government sees to to build uh, economies of scale. The other point uh, related to this is the reluctance hitherto of, and again, this is a, a legacy of the post-war anti-militarism of the. Um, civilian sector to work with the defense sector. So these two have been split uh, quite, quite, um, quite extremely. Um, so scientists and, so, and uh, so researchers have traditionally not wanted to work on, uh, on military uh, affairs. And uh, China doesn't have a problem with that. South Korea doesn't have a problem with that. Um, US doesn't have a problem with that. Russia doesn't have a problem with that. Japan has a problem with that. So in the, in the national security strategy, there was a, th- there was a refrain Right throughout the um, the document about getting the public sector and the and the defence uh, the private sector the private sector rather and the defence sector to work more closely together to sort of synergise the capabilities the, in- the innovation capabilities that Japan has and that I- that is such an important thing because without that Japan will find it very difficult to to get the technology the adv- the emerging technologies advanced technologies that it needs to to boost its uh, defence industrial base. And how combat ready do you think that the Japanese f- forces are, or how combat ready are they seen? Because I've seen parallels with um, Germany that, and you've mentioned Seitenwende, when they have decided that it is time to uh, really uh, double down on security and start investing in heavily, but that the c- militaries that they have at their disposal are kind of hollowed out after decades of. Uh, minimal investments and there is a chance that um, Japan might not have a decade to uh, get back to uh, where it might need to be in terms of kit military kit Japan's got some pretty pretty good uh, stocks of mili- military kit uh, there are issues with ammunition as I said earlier um, on the defense industrial base there are weaknesses there but in terms of some of the kit that they've got it's um <coughs> it's pretty good I think the issue for Japan is people, 
and there are ever fewer people, fewer Japanese every year. Japan's population is sort of falling uh, at, an ex at a very alarming rate. If you're, if you're the defense minister, you'll, you'll think, who am I going to, I've got all these ships I'm going to be buying, or these airplanes, who's, but who am I going to mm. get to fly them or, or to sail them? So this is a big problem for, for, for Japan, how to, well, a couple of things, how to make sure, how to make the, a career in the, the armed forces more attractive, so more attractive to women as well, um, to get the sort of young Japanese people away from um, sort of com home comforts and put them on a ship to go, out, <laughs> go sailing for, a, for, a, for extended periods. Um, that's one issue, but uh, um, the Japanese government is trying to deal with this um, through uh, a greater focus on technology, um, so what you can do with sort of high-tech high, high uh, kit and you don't need as many people. Mm. Um, so the Japanese government's working on saying space and uh, other areas to try and improve its uh, capabilities there. But the lack of people, I think, when you've got China uh, next door. I mean, China's also got demographic issues. I mean, they're, they're producing fewer babies than they have ever done. The, the loosening of the one-child policy hasn't really worked. But then China's population is what 1.3 billion or 4 billion. Um, so they, they've got a bit of leeway, a bit of runway still. Whereas Japan is um, you know they're falling I think population is falling by about half a million a year so that's like a whole city just disappearing mm. um, and of course uh, fewer uh, babies being born uh, as well so that I think for Japan is, is one of the big uh, the big issues and uh, they're, they're trying to deal with it uh, but obviously it's not an easy one to uh, to remedy overnight so I think my um, final question would be also inspired by Taiwan and that um, I guess also by Russia, and that's um, that. Definitely, what Taiwan is experiencing now is sort of the uh, one stage before a military conflict, which is an intense hybrid uh, uh, warfare from uh, from Chinese side, whether that's information warfare, espionage, economic warfare, um, and uh, I wonder. I've heard mentioning that there is now more of a cooperation on this and experience and lesson sharing between Taiwan and Japan and South Korea. And I would be wondering if Japan's experiencing this kind of uh, low intensity conflict from the Chinese side as well. Well, I think, I mean, you put your, your finger on the, what I think is the biggest risk in the short term to Taiwan, and that's this sort of hi hybrid hybrid warfare, so infiltration, cyber uh, disinformation, uh, also, you know, all, all of that uh, st stuff. Um, Japan's already experiencing it as well. Um, we mentioned earlier the, uh, the Senkaku Islands, Daiyu Islands in, uh, in, in, uh, in Chinese. Um, and China has been, sort of, as I said, nor trying to normalize its, its presence uh, around these islands. And uh, it's changed uh, the Coast Guard law. Uh, I think it changed um, quite recently to allow it to sort of prosecute its, um, its claim, territorial claims a bit more aggressively as well. So um, Japan has uh, experienced this uh, already. And if you look at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, you can see exactly the numbers of times that Chinese boats have been uh, in the Senkaku waters. And you can see that, as I said earlier, since, since Xi Jinping took office, it's, it's gone up mm. uh, pretty, uh, pretty alarmingly. Um, so that's one, uh, one issue for Japan. They're worried about uh, infiltra infiltration in universities, like, uh, like you see here in the uh, in UK as well. A lot of Chinese students uh, you know, have, have a presence in, um, in, the, uh, in Japanese universities. Um, they're also worried about Japanese researchers uh, inadvertently uh, giving, giving, giving secrets away, uh, to, uh, you know, industrial secrets or whatever, uh, away to China <coughs> as well. So this is now, <coughs> given how, uh, how open Japan has been uh, and how uh, particularly on the, um, on the research side and this reluctance to work on defense issues, um, that sort of made Japan more open, perhaps, than some other countries to to working uh, with China. The government's now trying to deal with that, uh, but again, it's it's creating it's creating issues uh, in in the area of research and uh, sort of areas that Japan's government's trying to trying to deal with um, is is actually is quite quite difficult to, for them to get their to get a grip on it. But these are the sort of things that Japan is uh, uh, is is experiencing. Right. Uh, well. I think um, 
that's all I have. So thank you so much uh, for coming and thank you for the interview. Many thanks. Thanks for your questions. <laughs> okay.